This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 318, recorded on January 2nd, 2015. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello and you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Happy New Year, everybody. Joining me today, right here in the TWIV studio, Dixon Despommiers. Hello, Vincent. How have you been, Dixon? I've been very well, thank you. You were traveling, right? I was. I was doing a southern tour by car. My wife and I went down the coast, got down to Savannah, headed west, got into to the middle part of Georgia, Drove from Macon up to Athens, from Athens to Chattanooga, from Chattanooga to Knoxville, from Knoxville to, let's see, where did we end up? In Baltimore, and then in Baltimore, and then finally home. In nice. a rainstorm almost all the time. Rain the, the whole time. Uh, yeah. Just about. I understand you were in the South too, Vincent. I was in Florida, yeah. Nice. So I picked up this horse throat. Uh-oh. Also joining us today, speaking of Florida, from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. How are you, How you doing? doing? All right. Oh, well, Rich. Are you so back you, in uh, Gainesville? I am in Gainesville, yes. I never left Gainesville. Uh, <laughs> others, <laughs> others came here. Ah. That's convenient, right? Uh, yes, that's convenient. What, what you got there, 80 degrees? Uh, 67. Really? I, I was in Orlando. The, I was in Orlando the previous week, and it was like high 70s, low 80s all week. Yeah, Christmas week was beautiful. Really nice. Christmas week was great. I even fired up the pool for the grandchildren. <laughs> fired up the pool. <laughs> yeah. So here, here it's five degrees Celsius. Right. And what were you uh, doing in Orlando? Went to Disney World. Good for you. It took the whole family. Great. Where'd you go in Disney World? We went to Epcot Magic Kingdom, and then we went to Universal Studios two days. Cool. And I had to, you know, go on some roller coasters because I'm a chicken. <laughs> Uh, also joining us today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Happy New Year to you, too. Happy New Year. Yeah, it's uh, 3 Celsius, 38 Fahrenheit up here in Western Mass, and we've got uh, supposed to have some wintry mix rolling in for the weekend. Oh, dear. It's, a, it's a nice day today, though, right? It's it's pretty nice today. Yeah. yeah, and then it's supposed to, the front's supposed to blow through, and then it gets brutally cold after that. Also joining us today from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody, and oh, happy birthday, Vincent. Thank you very much. Yes. Maybe we should all say it together. I want you to sing it. I want Rich <laughs> well, to sing yeah. it. Are we all singing? Yeah. Are you ready? <laughs> One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Vincent. Happy birthday to you. you. I'm going to have to balance that. <laughs> yeah, you know the problem is um, I don't know if everybody has this experience, but when I talk on Skype, it partially or totally mutes my my headphones. Really? Oh, that's too bad. Yeah, so it's it's almost simplex, uh, and and as I started to sing, everybody else disappeared. Did we? Too bad. I'm sorry. I, I thought you all stopped singing and were going to leave me hanging out <laughs> he there. Was, he was. That's why you were laughing, right? So, yes. Well, unfortunately, I could hear all of you. <laughs> and I was trying to speed up the tempo. People tend to sing it too much as a dirge, in my opinion. You want to do so. it again? Yeah. Well, it does. No. It, it is a song <laughs> about aging. <laughs> That's right. It is about aging. Anyway, thank you, everyone. I was born on this day in 1953, the year that the structure of DNA was solved. Wow. By Watson and Crick, who ripped off data from Rosalind Franklin. That, that they did. Right? That's right. And I want to play you a recording I made in Florida. I was walking through the airport... And my son said, Dad, you sound like Batman. I said, yeah, I do. And so I recorded this for the TWIV audience. Hi, everybody. This is Vincent Racaniello. And this week, while traveling, I acquired some sort of respiratory infection that has made me sound like Batman. And I'm not kidding. <laughs> Let's try it out. I'm the hero that Gotham needs but doesn't deserve. How's that? Good? Yeah. Not Love bad. it. And, and what's the background music from? I was in the airport. That's I was walking, the ah, I was walking to the, the gate. Airport. And the, ah. in the technology we have, we can record a podcast right walking through the airport. <laughs> it's a little noisy, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Uh, this is our 
annual review the previous year episode. Wow. But we do have some follows up or follow ups. I forgot what we decided. Follows ups. <laughs> follows <laughs> ups. <laughs> FUs. Exactly. Sorry, sorry, Kathy. Is that Felix sorry. Felix Unger? Does that stand for Felix Unger? <laughs> <laughs> Ken Stedman. Right, hi Vincent. Thanks for the twiv bump for my talk at ASV next summer. Looking forward to it. Also, thanks for the plug for the Phage book. I wrote a guest chapter. Will you be in San Diego for the meeting? If so, I'll see you there. No, I won't be. I'm sorry. I, I can't travel much next semester because I'm teaching. There you go. Happy holidays. P.S. I'm pretty sure that our did it in the hot tub virus infects a eukaryote, but I'll be talking about the archaeal viruses at ASV. See the cover of Virology, January 1st, 2015. Wow. So he has a paper in which the structure, uh, the first structure of a fusiliform virus was solved. And this is one of the viruses that Ken works on. It infects an archaeal host and has a DNA genome. Wow. It looks like it's taking off from the hot spring. It's so cool. <laughs> it's so cool. It's yeah, yeah, I see it. I can see it. I can see it. Anyway. It's very... He also wrote to Rich, thanks again for your wonderful work on Twiv. I just wanted to mention that the chlorella that are infected with phycodna viruses that I have worked on in my lab when not chasing hyperthermophile viruses <laughs> that you mentioned on Twiv 315 are, th- are green algae, not blue-green algae, which yeah. is, are an old name for cyanobacteria. There are also some really cool brown and red algae, the latter including kelp, the largest algae known. Thanks again for the great work on Twiv and beyond, and happy holidays. P.S. I'll ask Jim Van Etten about the phycodna virus that you discussed when I visit Lincoln in a couple of weeks. So the cyanobacteria is the current name for what were formerly blue-green algae, right? Right. And they're not algae. They're not green algae, which are different. Right. <clears throat> Okay. Uh, hey, Vincent, how are my levels now? Because I can turn up this microphone. Your levels good. are good. It's perfect. Your levels okay. are excellent. All right. Next is from Kevin. Hi, Twiv Gang. I want to commend you for taking up immunological topics, despite the intimidating alphabet soup and maddeningly complex cell subsets. Speaking as an immunologist, I can assure you that you're not alone in your frustration. You asked for your immunologist listeners to write in if you butchered anything. Well, you didn't, but I wanted to write in anyway with some comments. Rich's point about the need to look at TH17 knockouts was right on the money. In any inflammatory situation where you knock out IL-10, I would expect some additional inflammatory pathology, whether or not it was a problem in the wild-type disease. The immune system is a finely tuned instrument, and knocking out a key anti-inflammatory regulator is going to cause problems. In fact, these mice develop spontaneous colitis, inflammation of the large intestine, and gut pathologies can cause all kinds of other problems. I also wanted to point out that in your discussion of this knockout, you seem to get a bit confused between TH17, the cell type, and IL-17, the cytokine. This is an easy mistake to make, but I wanted to clarify. Knocking out the cytokine IL-17 or its receptor would not necessarily be the best experiment since the Th17 cells do much more than just secrete this cytokine. A more straightforward experiment would be to use knockouts of the transcription factor ROR gamma T, which, as you mentioned, is necessary for Th17 development. Right. So I had found a knockout of IL-17, I think. So are there ROR gamma T knockouts? Hmm. I don't know. That's what I uh, I wanted to knock out the cells. Yeah. So th- right. someone sh- search while I finish this. I'll do that. Please. As an aside, we've been slacking on our immunology podcast, Audio Immunity, but we've got big plans for the coming year. Hopefully, we'll be able to deliver. There's clearly a need for it. Thanks for all you do, and a happy new year to all. Yeah, so Kevin is uh, the, the author of the podcast, Audio Immunity, which is about immunology. They're up to episode, I think, 12, 9 up to episode nine. And their latest guest was Abby, who we had on not a couple of years ago, I guess. Do you think if you listen to that podcast and you're ready in your car, that might be an autoimmune response? <laughs> <laughs> it could be a title, Dixon, one day. Mm. All right. One more, one more follow-up. John Listen, Wright. why don't I read this and you save read your it. voice a little? Yes, please. <laughs> Go ahead. Know, hey, John Wright. They don't like my voice. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, They I love your wanna... real voice. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Information Vectors, on TWIV 317 at 25 minutes, 10 seconds, one of your Brazilian guests referred to the Culicoides mosquito. Oops. In English-speaking countries, the word mosquito means a member of the family Culicidae. 
genus Culicoides belongs to the related family Ceratopogonidae. <laughs> Why did I volunteer to read this? <laughs> Ceratopogonidae. I could have read it. Say it again, Alan? Ceratopogonidae is the way I, I would say it. All right, good. The word noceum describes the smaller species right. that fit through nets. In Spanish and Portuguese, mosquito is just the diminutive of the word for fly, and it may have a broader meaning. <laughs> so John. Cool. And he right. sends a reference uh, about biting midges and uh, I'll comment that I was going to uh, mention the same thing, but I didn't have quite as many facts as John did. Um, Culicoides parensis is the vector of Oropuche virus, um, and we know it as a midge. Right. Um, and he mentioned that they're uh, known also as vectors for blue tongue virus, and so there are several other uh, species of Culicoides that are listed for blue tongue. And then yeah. Alan has a connection to Culicoides yes, as well. Culicoides Dovey is a uh, nasty little biting midge that's found along the coasts of the Carolinas and Georgia and down into the Caribbean. No question about it. Named after, that is, d- named dove. after my, my grandfather. Oh, yeah. That's very that cool. cool. And Sneak. it also transmits Lidosomoides carinii. Hmm. Does it? Which you will be thrilled to learn is a uh, filarial parasite of rats. I was always hoping it would be a good vector. Good. <laughs> it is, it is. In fact, right. my first job here at Columbia as a technician was to de- to photograph the wings of Culicoides um, species so that they could fit into a taxonomic key to Dr. Roger Williams, who was a first-class medical entomologist and may have known your grandfather, by the way, Alan, uh, was developing. And my, that's where I learned uh, to love photography. A uh, very frustrating activity, by the way. <laughs> So, culicine, they probably meant to say culicine, mosquitoes. No, I think was saying there, was, it's, there are ROR gamma T knockout mice. Okay, good. Uh-huh. Thank you, Richard. Cool. And interestingly, they don't make lymph nodes. Really? Huh. Oh. Really? Interesting. Uh, so, Gustavo was speaking correctly because it, oh. it's mosquito in Spanish is the diminutive for fly, right? Mm-hmm. So, he was, that's the way they say it. Right. He wasn't right. wrong, but I wouldn't have picked that up. There's no way. So thank you, John. All right. So uh, just a quick wrap up of 2014. We published 53 episodes of TWIV. We didn't miss a week. Actually, we, we added, added one. one. <laughs> we added a week. It was That's leap right. year. <laughs> Some whatever word that is. Right. <laughs> Not leap year. We had a MERS special that pushed us to 53. And uh, we had 18 road trips. Wow. All over the place. ASM Biodefense Virocentricity, which was at NIH. Loyola. Uh, I did a, well, they interviewed me in, uh, in Fox Chase, Virginia Tech's uh, ASM in Boston, where Alan joined us and Kathy. But you weren't in the TWIV because you had something else to do. Right. Like, give a talk. Yeah. yeah. Baylor, uh, Fort Collins, ASV, Metamune, ASM in Australia. And I also did Lin Fa Wong episode there. Hamilton, Montana. Headquarters of ASM for number 300. Yep. Yes. Woo-hoo. Which we were all there. All for. of us. Yeah, even Dixon. Even me. <laughs> Amazing. I still amazed that you made it. Yeah, I was too, actually. Uh, International Congress of Virology at Montreal, Fox Chase for Anne Scalk, University of Georgia, uh, Einstein, and the Brazilian Society for Virology, the last episode of 2014. Wow. And we also had some solo interviews with Eugene Kuden, Peter Salk, Lin Fa Wang, and Tom Solomon. So our episodes were downloaded 732,000 times in, seven, in 2004. That's all episodes, not just the ones we published in. That's amazing. And at all time, we were probably over 3 million. Wow. I, I mean, for sure at 2.7 million, but I, I changed um, providers at one point, so we lost all the early stats. So, so we truly are viral. <clears throat> for sure. We are very lucky to have so many <laughs> listeners, yeah. We also published 23 videos on YouTube, which have seen about 14,000 views, so... That's obviously a fraction of the audio, but I, now and then I think audio, a video is cool, especially when we have guests so that people can see what they look like. Yeah, we have a lot of people who um, who appreciate the podcast in the car, so I certainly hope they're not watching the video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, eventually they're going to have screens on the dashboard that play. Well, they yeah. already have screens, yeah, right? like, be, like people aren't distracted enough driving now. Yep. Well, everyone agreed that our top story of 2014 was... The polio vaccine, no, sorry, (laughs) the Ebola virus outbreak in West Africa. We had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 episodes of TWIV in which we either devoted the whole episode to Ebola virus or part of it. And that's an outbreak that began at the end of 2013. 
with a single infected child. Amazing. And then spread uncontrollably in three uh, West African nations. And it's still ongoing. There is a great uh, summary, of course. What is it called? The sit rap? Sit rep? Uh, Sit rep, yeah. Sit rep. And they they have a great um, summary of what's going on. Let me get it here just to tell everyone. Situation reports. Yeah, the most recent one is great. Oh, come on. Loading. 20,206 yes, uh, total cases, 7,905 deaths. Uh, and if you look at the charts, it's sort of level in Guinea uh, at between 100 and 150 cases a week. It's definitely on the decline in Liberia down right. to less than... 50 cases a week recently, and it looks like it's actually declining in Sierra Leone from a oh, peak, yeah. uh, even though that's the still the most intense yep. uh, area of, uh, of infection. And there right. are pockets of infection that are still really intense. And there's uh, the usual summary of uh, what percent occupancy the uh, Ebola treatment center beds are and uh, how effective uh, the contacts uh, identifying contacts is and uh, the burial teams and it looks like the roadmap is being reasonably well executed and having an effect. It's amazing what happens when you follow the directions. Yeah. Ain't it though? There's also a case in, in, uh, in the UK, right? An imported case, one of the healthcare right. workers. Yes. That's in Glasgow. Transferred almost immediately to London. The latest WHO um, bulletin was on the 26th people who caught it in Africa and then went back to their country of origin for treatment. And I think there were six or eight deaths so far. The rest survive. So what's the occupancy, uh, Rich? Do you know offhand? Uh, the uh, oh, sorry. Uh, the uh, occupancy of Ebola treatment center beds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see here. There's, in, a graph. There's a graph there, yeah. Yeah, Table so about 35%. 30, so they're not full. Uh, no, the, one of the problems here, they have uh, uh, more than one bed per patient. The problem is the distribution, right. as I understand it. Sure. Okay, So they got plenty of beds, but the beds aren't necessarily in the right place. Which, you three, know, if you think about it in a global sense, that's been the problem all along. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's th uh, actually in uh, Sierra Leone, it's 50%. Operational in the others, it's uh, 35 36 percent. They have um, the, the overall case fatality rate is 71 percent for the 52 week period, and there's no evidence of a change in that. And also, I thought interesting was um, this, that uh, there are 254 safe burial teams in place in the wow. three countries to, 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 to teach people. Uh, has, has very any, properly. Has and, anybody? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm interrupting. Yes, you are. And uh, <laughs> and uh, um, contact tracing is the other thing I wanted to point out. Uh, effective contact tracing um, contacts of confirmed cases are visited daily to monitor for symptoms. Right. And, and another interesting thing about the case fatality rate is 71 percent overall, but for the people who are hospitalized. Um, the rate is actually fifty-eight to sixty yes. percent. Yes, but um, good to so be it, it's hospital. actually these these hospitals are serving the function that they're supposed to serve for the patients. They're they're saving lives. Yeah, right. It's really good. Has anybody published anything yet on sero surveys to see how no. many people might have acquired it without no. getting? No, you know, I was talking to someone from the Lipkin Lab two weeks ago, and he was about to go to one of these three countries, and I said, "You're going to." take some specimens he said no we're not allowed to do any research really? we're only going to help we're not allowed to take any samples and do any sort of research hmm. so it, it'll maybe a while before we see that effect that actually yeah that makes sense because you can't you i mean there's a huge huge trust problem here which is really the crux of the matter yeah. um and you can't go around having there there are already rumors that this has uh, been deliberately caused and that you know they're they're being used as lab rats, and so if you have people doing some kind of research, even if it's intended to benefit the public, um, that's just not going to work. 
Kathy, you had found this paper on the, uh, or this article on the bat tree. Can you comment on that? Sure. Uh, it was a paper in uh, Embo Molecular Medicine, some uh, <clears throat> Embo journal I hadn't heard of before, where some researchers had gone in April uh, immediately to the area of the where that first child uh, had contracted Ebola, and uh, they had ecologists and uh, veterinarians, and they collected uh, bats and mist nets, and uh, came up with a plausible hypothesis that can't really be tested that a tree near the child's home uh, housed. Uh, insectivorous bats, so not fruit-eating bats, but insect-eating bats that these children uh, played with, and there's some evidence that those bats uh, or that that kind of bat can be infected by Ebola virus. There have been antibody-positive bats found elsewhere, and so the hypothesis is that maybe bats in that tree were the source because they kind of tried to rule out other possibilities like the fruit eating bats and also the um, game uh, bushmeat hypothesis because this area isn't one where people would ordinarily be uh, coming into contact with bushmeat and the fact that the women and children became infected before the hunters uh, was something in favor of that. The Part of the reason they can't really... Uh, push this any further is that the tree caught fire and when it did a whole bunch of bats evidently flew out um but uh so there's evidently no longer bats in that tree uh, so because there's anyway, no tree it, you know it's a pretty high profile paper published uh where most of the data are indirect and because oh once the bat tree is dead you can't shed any more light on it uh, yeah. oh. That's a great. thinker. That was a groaning thinker. It's great. Yes. I like it though. Man, yeah, it's it's a it's an inconclusive. Uh, study. It's a horribly in. Inc- I mean, it's. Um, Do you think they I, I totally understand why it was news, but it just it was a very frustrating paper to read. Yeah. What are you saying, Dixon? I said, "Do you think they they fired up the tree on purpose to get rid of it?" Do you think there was an assault on the battery? Uh, oh. 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 Okay, uh, two other things I can mention. Uh, just just was, this week. I've been holding on to that one all week. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going right by. Uh, for those of you that uh, maybe haven't looked at your Tuesday Science Times from the New York Times, the, the entire eight-page section is uh, an investigation into how the opportunity to control the virus uh, slipped away and interviews with some important players and uh, timelines and graphs and things that are interesting. Which we've, of course, talked about before. Yeah. And then, uh, just this morning, the front page right-hand story in the New York Times was that uh, doctors are in disagreement about whether hydration therapy is the best thing to do for Ebola patients. So that kind of thing is just still getting front page headlines. While I was away, there was an, another incident at a CDC laboratory, a BSL-4 lab. Apparently, a sample which was not supposed to have infectious Ebola virus was sent out of the lab, and technician may have contacted it, and that person is being monitored, still free of symptoms, though. Mm. And I don't know exactly what happened, but from my trips to BSL-4 labs, I can tell you that if you have a sample of Ebola virus in the BSL-4 and say you want to sequence it, and what you do is you inactivate the virus. You add a, a material like trizol that disrupts the virus and renders it non-infectious, and that's in a tube. Then you put the tube in a dunk tank in the BSL-4, so the exterior is completely contam- decontaminated, and then someone outside can reach into the dunk tank and pull the tube out. So that's the procedure for getting things out. And apparently this tube had non-inactivated virus due to some mishap of some right. sort. And it got, so, it got transferred from the BSL-4 to the BSL-2 lab where right. somebody subsequently worked with it. <clears throat> right. Um, so there's a little more detail, at least in the New York Times, uh, quoting Dr. Stuart Nichol. Uh, there had been two sets of fluid samples from guinea pigs infected with Ebola. The fluid was handled as if it contained live virus, although it wasn't certain that there was even virus present. One set of samples uh, was supposed to stay in the lab so that they could try and isolate virus. The other was to be treated with a solution that would kill the virus 
and sent out to the, a lower level lab. Somehow the samples were switched. The one with the killed virus stayed in the lab and the one that might have had live virus was sent out. Mm. They're investigating it. and So there are many people, of course, um, saying ridiculous things, um, saying, you know, these people are idiots. I mean, Richard Ebright at Rutgers, who's a big opponent of a lot of this work, you see, he said, like, what, can't these people get it right? You know, if this is useless. This work has to go on. We just have to develop better procedures for making sure this doesn't happen. We need, what we need is some, a lot of more standardization of it as well. Probably. Yep. I mean, one of the things that struck me in touring the needle was the discussions that we had about how different BSL-4s, not just around the world, but around the country, um, do things differently, and they're all, you know, yeah. they develop their own procedures, and those procedures are robust as we saw it's lots and lots of levels of security but if everybody's doing things differently um you can't really evaluate a system and say okay here's what we need to change because then you look at another lab and you say oh well they don't do it that way at all um so i, I think there really needs to be i think what's finally happening now is there's this uh i believe the cdc just um just put somebody in as a as um basically being in charge of all this right yeah what do they call this person the, the chief virologist or <laughs> the something? poor schmuck would be the appropriate <laughs> title but let's see i just saw it this morning um they call it the uh, oh it's got some name what is this person's name come on guys you know what it is yeah a virus the, chief yeah they got a picture of um, the virus chief is yeah. an inventive title. Safety chief. Safety. <laughs> safety. CDC safety, safety yeah. chief. Shouldn't they all be safety chiefs? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's unfortunate. I mean, yeah, it is. you know, this is being done, being worked on more than it ever has before. So right, right. that's why, Alan, you're absolutely right. You, you need to have more st at procedures such that only one person is not involved, right? So right. to check the tubes or whatever, sure, they color sure. code, hey, you, you got this wrong and so forth. Yeah, right. yeah there has to be not just cross-checking, but also, you know, there should be a checklist that you follow. I and Okay, we take checklist. this tube and this yeah. person's right. holding this tube and I've got it. Now you've got it. Okay. Now you hand it through, you know, and you follow through the procedure. The answer is not to stop the research, okay? No, of course not. As, as a number of people would like to do. So just work this out. All right, now I would like to know where you guys think in 2015 Ebola is going is it going to, are we going to see the end of it in 2015 is it going to spread to other countries what do you what do you guys think it's going away it's going away this year it'll be gone by june do you think before by, any by july it'll be gone in 6 months before any vaccine is available and used right oh uh, yeah mm. okay what do you yeah, think i'm i'm with rich i i would say i would say <laughs> 6 to 8 months <clears throat> this thing should be contained in africa um there, there may very well be additional um, introductions to other countries, you know, like the cases that we've seen where somebody um, is treating patients there and then goes home and um, then they have to be dealt with there. But I, I think this is, this is now on the downswing. I really hope that as a result of this, there is some permanent improvement in the healthcare infrastructure in the affected countries and the surrounding countries as well. And in other countries sure. similarly situated. Yeah. Not just not just in that part of the world. Yeah. And I hope maybe yeah. it can restore the credibility of uh, some of the agencies involved, remove some of the fear and superstition that uh, the World Health Organization sure. can move in with a plan and uh, get the cooperation of a lot of people and bring this under control. I hope people appreciate that. Yeah, the biggest black box uh, issue, I think, is not knowing where it first came from. And so you don't know if there are carriers or, uh, on, you know, like bats, for instance, with rabies. They don't get sick from that, but we do. Uh, are there animals out there that don't get sick from Ebola that could start this up again? And uh, this little girl in the bat tree was uh, a guess. It wasn't uh, a fact. So, Well, but of course there's a reservoir out there because this thing has been sporadically well, erupting probably since time as, immemorial. Yeah, sure, Alan. So as encroachment increases, as the population of sub-Saharan Africa increases and they go into more and more uh, unoccupied uh, zones, uh, Ebola will emerge and other viral infections probably a Absolutely. Too. And in places where it's occurred before, um, what you see when there's yeah, been yeah. when there when there have been appropriate procedures put in place is we still get sporadic cases. I That's think right. Uganda had, yeah, yeah, had yeah. one just a couple of years ago, sure. and what happens is that person shows up sick, 
everybody at the hospital knows exactly what to do. Right. They contain that case, and that person either lives or dies, depending on the case fatality, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. for that case. Um, and sucks to be them, but it doesn't transfer to anybody else. Right. So I'm with so Rich. So that's, that's how to deal with this long term. I think uh, Rich is right. I think uh, if the healthcare and, uh, procedures increase and improve and become more standardized to countries that can control it, then you will see it go away in Guinea and Liberia and in Sierra Leone too. So there was also a story in NPR this morning uh, interviewing a disease ecologist, David Heyman, who was a graduate student at University of Cambridge, and he had collected samples from fruit bats in Ghana and found uh, that their blood had a high level of antibodies against Ebola Zaire. Um, and then, uh, so he said it, it kind of fell on deaf ears at the time, but now people are starting to listen. <laughs> anyway, I pasted the link to the story into the show notes, and... Um, they also interviewed Kevin Olival at EcoHealth Alliance in New York City, um, who hunts down uh, Nipah virus in bats. And uh, the thing I want to point out is that they're talking about something that you guys uh, were just mentioning, is that they're working on, or it, alluding to perhaps, building an early warning system for dangerous viruses that could alert co communities when there's a risk of an outbreak that's really high. Um, and then people could be more careful when hunting bats or avoid bat guano or whatever. So I think what Rich was saying is that that there will be progress and better things to come of this uh, from learning from all these things, I think, is was the gist of what I got out of this NPR story this morning. Mm -hmm. And the bigger problem that we can't seem to be able to solve is providing situations where people don't feel the need to hunt bats in order to eat. Right. Yeah. But I don't think that's going to get fixed in the next six to eight months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, either way, you you will hear about it here on TWIV. Yes. Got it right. Com place to come for intelligent discussion about viruses. You betcha. All right, uh, Kathy, can you take the next story? Now, so the remaining nine stories are not in any particular order. So we all agree that Ebola was the number one story of 2014. The next ones we really like, but they're in no particular order. Right. So uh, this one was the paper from Dieter Bloss's lab. Uh, we talked about it on TWIV 267, and it's about the directional uncoding of rhinovirus RNA. And it, I... I am a dinosaur, so I have a paper copy of it, and I got it. I got it back out and was looking at my comments, and in the margins at various places, I have written, "Wow, really cool, beautiful," and uh, so this paper addresses a, an interesting question, and that is for the viruses that are in the endosome that don't have an envelope that can fuse with the membrane. How do they? How does their nucleic acid get out? And uh, Dieter Blass's lab evidently has been working on this for a long time and uh, thinks that there's some kind of pores um, at the areas of twofold symmetry, threefold and, and fivefold as well, but primarily at twofold symmetry where the RNA may come out. And so they used a variety of techniques that uh, some of them were new to us and we really got into learning about those. And they showed that the three prime end of the RNA is what exits the virion first. And this kind of blew the minds of people like Rich who thought that the 5 prime end should go out first so that it could start uh, getting translated right away. Um, but maybe it has more to do with how it went in and maybe it went in last and comes out first. And uh, at the end, it was kind of summarized by Alan. They use a variety of techniques and one of them is that the, the gist of it is that they show that the three prime end is exposed and it binds to a fluorescent oligo that they then uh, show that in a variety of ways. And the five prime end uh, lags behind. It stays inside the virion particle longer in their uh, exit studies. And there it's protected from nuclease. So they kind of addressed the question from the two ends of the nucleic acid. They use this fluorescent correlation spectroscopy, mm -hmm. spectrometry, yeah. whatever. Um, they had really cool graphical representations of that. They used Sorolin cross-linking. They used electron microscopy. And then, the, and they saw that when these particles, uh, when the RNA was partly out and they froze them using the Sorolin UV cross-linking, that they got these uh, particles that seemed to have rods in them. And then they thought, well, that 
that might be an artifact. So then they went and did cryo EM on the particles where they didn't have to stain and, and wouldn't have staining artifacts. And they found even more evidence for this. And, and then they used capillary electrophoresis and RT PCR, and they have a really cool model. So to me, it's just a really great story and very well put together in terms of a lot of experimental approaches clearly explained and all pointing toward this interesting finding. They broke out all the cool toys and showed something really, really neat. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and I spent about two hours trying to understand uh, fluorescence correlation spectroscopy <laughs> and learned quite a bit. It was great. Yeah. Yeah, someone wrote in that you did a good job on that. Oh. Hmm. We did read that. By the way, I have a model of a picornovirus on my desk, which Ann Palmenberg gave me, and it's filled with her beaded viral RNA, right? She made this for me, 7,440 bases, each each of the four bases a different color. And, of course, the poly A tail is all red. And each other day, it was just sitting there, you know, randomly the, the RNA starts to come out when people pick it up, and the three prime end was out. Oh, cool. <laughs> it was so cool. I said, wow, look at this. Dieter is right. <laughs> it's made out of macaroni, by the way. Uh, so Anne actually put the right sequence in the air. Yeah, she did. Took her a long time. Boy, that's a labor of She lot. said she did it during the boring World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to get email. Uh, right, Anne, don't write us. I didn't even watch. You won't get any from Germany, that's for sure. No, somebody will just call and hoot a vuvuzela. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, the next story I thought was important was... Uh, the controversy that has been brewing for over a year, but which came to the fore in this past year, was about working with potentially pandemic pathogens. Uh, this was really begun by Mark Lipsitch and a number of others uh, previous years who were worried that making aerosol transmissible H5N1 is not a good idea. And they constructed a variety of doomsday scenarios saying that these could get out and kill half the world's population. And the, he has written a number of posts on this. I've responded as well. We've talked about it on TWIV, in particular TWIV 287. Uh, we discussed it. Uh, as a result, which was astounding to me and to Alan Dove, uh, a pause was implemented by the White House on 4.30 on a Friday afternoon. What was it, September, Alan? Uh, something like that. They said all, all research on influenza, SARS, and MERS, which involves um, giving it new properties. They call it gain of function, which is a horrible name, and everyone now has agreed that it's not a good name, uh, should be stopped, which is crazy because in the meantime, a discussion is ensuing for the next year or so, and that's fine to talk about risks and benefits and so forth, but a pause I thought was really absurd. Well, and a pause that was that poorly phrased and that, you know, strangely released it was just the the explanation of the thing was so brief and so vaguely worded that um you know i i i was um chatting back and forth with matt freeman about this um over twitter a little bit and over email um and one of my first questions to him was what does this cover and he said i don't know yeah it wasn't clear enough <laughs> nobody so everybody who worked on any of these respiratory viruses just had to sit there on their hands waiting for the NIH to tell them whether or not they could go to work in the morning. And one of the things that I read, there's a whole MBIO series of editorials and perspectives and things, like, so I can't quite remember who said it, but you could think that even passing one of these viruses, influenza, MERS, or SARS, just growing the virus could be prohibited because with an RNA virus, there's mutations all the time, and so you would be potentially changing its mm -hmm. pathogenicity. So Precisely. That, yeah. Well, the problem is I don't. It was poorly worded, but also I don't think it was necessary because, no. as was pointed out by Cas Casa Deval and I think Mike Imperiali in an article in Bio, you know, this is a doomsday scenario which, by nature, is scary. Yet all the assumptions that lead to this doomsday scenario are not particularly correct and so the likelihood that one first of all everyone ignores the fact that the ferret adapted influenza h5n one lost pathogenicity for ferrets and it probably wouldn't do anything in people but assuming it would all the constructs are artificial and this is a this is an issue as as kathy writes in the show notes we really didn't give it a lot of time because of ebola but we really need to get back to it. and i think in the next month i want to do an episode on this whole discussion and bring some people in and talk about it 
Um, but in the meanwhile, the um, NSABB, the National whatever Biosecurity, <laughs> what, what, um, has had a meeting, and Paul Dupre and others spoke at that meeting. The National Academy of Sciences has had a meeting on this uh, issue. And some of the MERS work has now uh, been allowed to go forward, including Matt's and Ralph Barrick's, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is going. This discussion is going to go on in the next year, in which time the uh, pause is still holding for influenza. Um, and I got a letter last week from Ron Fouché, who, of course, is one of the individuals doing the H five N one transmission um, experiments. And he's and his work is stopped, even though he's in the Netherlands because he uh, uses NIH funds for his work. And he he's commenting in a letter to me on an article by Lipsitch and Inglesby. It's called Moratorium on Research Intended to Create Novel Potential Pandemic Pathogens. Listen to this title, Intended to Create Novel Potential Pandemic Pathogens. The title is just inflammatory. It's totally absurd. It's not intended to create that. But anyway, he says that their um, risk-benefit calculations are wrong because they didn't take into consideration the, uh, the, the containment that's used in these laboratories. And if you read their paper, it's full of ridiculous assumptions. And um, and so basically, Fouché wrote an article or a response which is going to be published in MBio. And here is a sentence from the article. From this analysis, the conservative estimate is that when in the Erasmus Medical Center facility, which is where he works, to which 10 persons have access, researchers performed on transmission of influenza viruses via respiratory droplets were aerosols between ferrets, one laboratory acquired infection would be expected to occur less frequently than once every one million years. <laughs> okay, so the numbers are different because of the con- containment. And these guys don't consider that because it doesn't fit their story. And that's they, a problem I've always had with this, this, uh, this pause. The yes. problem I've had with it is that it disregards the entire history of vaccine development. Yes, I agree. Because when I when I finally was able to read the Fouchier and Kawaoka papers that kicked off this whole brouhaha, um, the very first thing that popped into my head as they're passaging they're talking about passaging these viruses repeatedly through ferrets, you know, to improve pass to improve, you know, passage through the ferrets, and I thought this is how you attenuate a virus. Right. That is exactly what you would want to do if you wanted an attenuated strain of the virus. Yeah, sure. You would pass it rapidly through something not its natural host. So if you go back to classical vaccine development, I mean, this has been done over and over and over again under far less containment. Exactly. And we're all still here. It doesn't fit their story. It just, none okay. of that, none it, of maybe that. Maybe they don't even know about it, but it doesn't fit their story. Anna. No, of course they know the history of this, but it doesn't fit the story. Exactly. They've, they've taken an extreme stance and constructed the data around that stance. Correct. You see, what, what is appalling to me is that the White House, or whoever was behind this, ignored all of the history of virology and, and listened to a couple of individuals not coming from a virology field who said this could be dangerous. I said, okay, yeah, it might be, so we're going to stop the research. I think this is just absurd. Wait, then you should stop all research on atomic weapons first. That's what I said before. Right. The problem is that once you, um, <laughs> you, <can't. laughs> once, you, once you bring up a safety argument about something that is not um, right. You know, that's not immediately funded by the Pentagon, which is why the, the weapons that's work sad. is allowed. <laughs> um, well, as soon as you say, oh, us, right? <clears throat> this could be unsafe, the atmosphere uh, these days, especially in Washington, is, well, I don't want to be responsible for it. It's yeah, as covering. That's, that's certainly a big part of it. Covering their asses. So anyway, we, we will obviously dedicate an entire episode to this. I want yes. to get, I want to get uh, some we're, we're and, almost doing it now. Yeah. But, but anyway, right. uh, Ron ended his um, letter by saying, the construction of our new BSL-3 Plus facility uh, should be ready in a few months. I will let you know when it's ready for a visit to see if you're still interested. So remember, well, he... What does the plus mm-hmm. stand for? Uh, well, it's more than three <laughs> to accommodate the H5N1. 3.5, 3.5. Uh, yeah, you have to do certain yeah. other things besides yeah. a BSL-3 to accommodate the transmission experiments with right. influenza virus. Right, 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 right. Okay. Um, the next one is um, a rich pick. Tell right, us about so. that. <clears throat> On uh, uh, Vincent and I visited Eugene Coonan. Well, <laughs> I guess you were off study section by that time, but we... Was I? You? No, I think I was. You were still on? 
I don't okay. know, maybe not. Anyway, we no, met. No, I wasn't. Washington. You're right, because I was waiting for you to finish your lunch. Yeah, we met. We <laughs> met in Washington uh, 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 in conjunction with a study section meeting, and we visited uh, Eugene Coonan at NIH and uh, talked to him basically about virus evolution. And to me, it was just absolutely a fascinating conversation. This and was going to be the, this was going to be one of my picks, but I didn't get here till one fifty nine. And uh, there were two things we talked about. Uh, mostly in detail. It was all about virus evolution. A lot of it was about the uh, evolution of the uh, NCLDV, NCLDVs, uh, what is that, uh, nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses. These include the, you know, f f the small guys are the pox viruses, and it goes up to the Mimi and the Mama and the Pandora viruses, and et cetera, and uh, covering the question of how they evolved and whether they, uh, I think we actually even discussed a little bit the idea of a fourth domain of life that no longer exists and these viruses being reduced from that, hmm. as opposed to the theory that, in fact, uh, they uh, evolved um, uh, more or less co-evolved with uh, cells. Um, what I liked, uh, and uh, Eugene favors that, by the way, it doesn't uh, buy into the fourth domain of life hypothesis, and actually, uh, subsequent to this uh, interview, published a uh, paper that dealt with that in exquisite detail. At any rate, what I liked more than anything else that I guess may have been kind of in my mind, but I'd never really seen it, was this uh, idea that uh, viruses, or the, all of the replication styles, uh, were in the primordial soup in pre-cellular life. Uh, and out of those, uh, double-stranded DNA was chosen to be uh, cellularized. And subsequent to that, we have evolution of viruses or viruses co-evolving uh, with cellular organisms. So the notion that basically there is a pre-cellular uh, or at least co-cellular time in the primordial soup where um, we have all all the different uh, replication styles of uh, viruses going on just and things evolve from that just fascinates me. I loved it. Yeah. Yes, so sir. Eugene was good fun. It was a good episode. And Eugene will be at ASV this summer as well. He'll be in a session called Virocentricity, which was the title of that episode. Mm-hmm. Kathy, you had one next. Oh, I picked this one that we did pretty recently. Well, I guess relatively, TWIV-303, uh, inhibition of Borna disease virus by an endogenous element. And uh, I know that uh, you found this paper, Vincent, just after you had talked to Carla Saleh mm -hmm. uh, about the finding that she talked about both at ASV and the International Congress of Virology, where um, there are DNAs found in insect genomes that have been uh, reverse transcribed from uh, the viruses and uh, by a, a insect uh, reverse transcriptase. And that those then are used to make uh, interfering RNAs that then de defend, help the insect defend against the infection. And then you saw this paper inhibition of Borna disease virus replication by an endogenous Borna-like element in the ground squirrel genome, and thought at first that maybe it was going to be the same kind of mechanism, um, an interfering RNA mechanism, but um, it wasn't. Mm. And uh, so this is, I, I think, a cool story because it reminds us that there are other viral DNAs in our genomes and mammalian genomes that aren't just from retroviruses. In fact, you mentioned um, Ebola, and uh, Bornavirus sequences are found there. And so, uh, these authors who are from, let's see, uh, Kyoto and University of Wisconsin Oshkosh found that uh, there's a Bornavirus disease sequence in this uh, striped squirrel, 13 striped squirrel, and that this... Um, in, has these, uh, there are these long conserved open reading frames found, and the fact that they're conserved implies that they may be functional, that they're not just some kind of random baggage that the genome has picked up. And so they introduce those sequences into persistently infected cells, 
uh, and showed that that altered the virus uh, persistence. And then they also did, they made cells that were expressing the gene that's in the genome, um, expressing a tagged version of that and infected those cells with bornavirus and showed that the replication of the virus, again, is reduced. And so it appears that the protein itself is doing this by a um, dominant negative kind of mechanism, and that's intriguing. And then also the fact that this ORF is conserved in the human genome, but it doesn't function in the human genome in the same way right. that it does in the squirrel, the 13 striped squirrel genome. Yeah. So a lot of interesting things there, uh, it seemed like, to build on and go forward from. I think we're going to hear more about this in the next year with different mm -hmm. viruses and different endogenous elements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure the squirrels were not the only ones. <clears throat> right. All right, my, my uh, next, uh, our next story is... We're up to six now. Number this six. Is number six. Yep. yep. MERS coronavirus in dromedary camels. Now, in 2013, MERS was a big one. We had lots of... In our year-end special, which I was looking at, uh, we had had a lot of stories that year on, on MERS. Not so many this year. We had a TWIFT special with Ian Lipkin and um, Thomas Parisa when they announced their finding of antibodies to MERS coronavirus in dromedary camels going back into the 90s. Uh, and then TWIFT 287 with Matt Freeman. Um, and the cases continue to uh, accumulate slowly. I think so far there are 941 laboratory con uh, confirmed cases of infection, largely again uh, in the Middle East, and 347 deaths. They continue to be in people with uh, immunological problems. Um, and this year, it was found that uh, the dromedary camel seems to be a reservoir of the virus. You can find antibodies in the camels. Camels can be infected. A paper was published not too long ago in work done at, at uh, Colorado State University. Done at the time we were at ASV, they infected camels with the virus and showed that they get infected in the respiratory tract and they shed virus in respiratory secretions. And they then, had camels in Fort Collins? Yeah, they did. And Vincent Munster from Rocky Mountain uh, was doing this experiment with some local people. And, and I said, can I go see them? And he said, sure, but he never took me. I wanted to go see these oh, camels. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, I was at, a, I was at a, the Rocky Mountain Virology Club or whatever mm -hmm. it was meeting uh, up in... Uh, Hamilton. Up in the, up in the mountains. Oh, even, yeah. Pi uh, I forget the name of the... Uh, site outside of uh, Fort Collins and the uh, woman who did those experiments with the camels uh, gave a talk and showed a lot of pictures of the camels and described the whole thing. She was really pumped, really excited. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a great talk. It was very interesting. Um, and a, a paper was also published this year showing uh, a camel in a barn of a person who had developed MERS uh, was positive for the same virus that the, that the man acquired. It was in the air in the in the barn as well. So these are all pretty strong indications that camels are important. In fact, WHO says people should avoid drinking raw camel milk or camel urine or eating meat that has not been properly cooked and avoid close contact with camels when visiting farms and other areas. So would you say they found the smoking camel? Yeah, they did. Oof. <laughs> Oof. Um, now, the thing is that we, we actually have a letter uh, here later on from an individual who's, who says, there are some cases where there's no contact with a camel. And that's always been the case. There have always been cases since this began of individuals who get sick, and there's no known contact with an animal of any kind, except humans, I suppose. Uh -huh. So we don't know how those infections occur, because there's not really good evidence for, for sustained transmission. There's some transmission among you know, hospital uh, patients and, and workers and so forth, and close family groups, but... It doesn't transmit well in, in the general population, and it's really not clear how uh, these infections occur. So I think we still have quite a bit to learn. It begs uh, the question of whether there's a human carrier. <clears throat> uh, yes. I don't think there's any evidence for that so far. Uh, have they looked? Uh, there have been some serological studies. For example, they looked in workers in an abattoir where they slaughter okay. camels, and they were right. not seropositive. That's very and You would think they would be, because the animals sure. are certainly infected, but... Maybe they weren't infected at the time of slaughter. Who knows, right? Right. So there's still a lot to be done with this. 
Um, it is still a pretty localized infection to the Middle East, Absolutely. which is where the camels are, I suppose, that carry the virus. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I don't think it's going anywhere in a big way, but we should be ready because you never know. I would say let's make a vaccine just in case so don't we don't get caught in an Ebola situation. Well, because this one could potentially be more easily transmissible. Yeah, because it already does transmit uh, by through the air because that's yeah, how you get it's it already cameras, a respiratory right? virus. Yeah. Okay, Rich, you are next. So my uh, next pick was the oncolytic measles paper that we did in twelve two ninety eight. So the concept of oncolytic uh, using viruses to treat cancer uh, is making strides. And this is the first example that I can think of, uh, well, probably not, but it's the one that stands out in my mind of uh, really an astonishing, although it's only a couple of cases, success uh, with uh, the use of a virus as an oncolytic agent. And it involves, this was a uh, paper from, oops, I've lost it. Uh, it was from the Mayo Clinic mm-hmm. uh, Journal. Um, uh, I know I've got. Uh, uh, pardon me here. I've got it on a uh, an Adobe document. That's why I couldn't find it. Uh, okay, it's from the um, Mayo Clinic uh, Remission of Disseminated Cancer After Systemic Oncolytic Virotherapy. First author Russell. Last author. Dispensary, and what they did, they had uh, two patients. They were investigating the use of uh, measles virus as an oncolytic agent, um, and in particular, they used the vaccine strain of measles virus that has inserted in it a uh, gene that um, is a an, an iodine transport gene, so that. It's the sodium iodide synporter, called abbreviated NIS, uh, so that they can uh, not only uh, track the infection by uh, treating infected patients with radioactive iodine and looking where it concentrates because of the presence of this synporter, but concentration of the radioactive iodine could itself have a radiotherapeutic effect uh, locally on the tumor. At any rate, they had uh, two individuals who had um, multiple myeloma, which is a uh, disease of lymphatic origin in particular. Uh, it's a B-cell. It's a plasma cytoma. So it's, uh, or it's a Yes, a plasma cytoma. So it's a disease, a disease of plasma cells. Uh, so those are the cells that make uh, antibody. Um, and these two patients uh, had basically uh, uh, failed bone marrow transplants and all sorts of chemotherapy over a period of years. So as is typical with these sorts of, this was actually a phase one trial, as is typical with these uh, sorts of trials, these are patients who've flunked everything and they uh, gave them 10 to the 11th Hmm. of this uh, virus intravenously and they had a pretty uh, dramatic systemic reaction to start with with uh, fever and nausea and etc and then in both of them they got within days uh, remission of uh, tumors and one of them I don't know what the recent history on this is. One of them um, relapsed after some period of time, but the other one, uh, for weeks at least, if not months, was uh, disease-free following uh, this treatment. So I thought that this was really a pretty dramatic demonstration of advances in uh, oncolytic virotherapy. It's really cool. Yeah, this field has really exploded. Tons of, of uh, not just measles but other viruses as well mm-hmm. are yeah. oh yeah used. there's a bunch out there They're very promising it's amazing one of the tricks with the measles treatment in this particular case is that uh, measles uses this receptor cd46 which is uh, present on uh, cells of lymphoid or uh, origin and in particular these multiple myeloma cells so mm-hmm. yeah. uh, although it would infect lots of different cells it would target specifically the multiple myeloma cells as well and what's cool about that is that it is the measles vaccine strain that binds to that receptor. Right. And right. it makes it attenuated. 
and safe in general, whereas the wild-type measles uses a totally different receptor and wouldn't be appropriate for this. So this is so cool. It's a, everything coming together to work it properly. It be called change of function rather than gain of function. Well, there are other terms that have been suggested, yes. and when we talk about that, we will definitely go into that. But yes, Paul Dupre will say that, in fact, the measles vaccine is a gain of function virus, and if you uh, want to block that research, you wouldn't have a measles vaccine. Right. Right. So don't be stupid. Right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Uh, I thought that the two norovirus stories this year were absolutely amazing, and so did Kathy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like these two. I especially like the B cell one. But yeah, so mm -hmm. the th two of three, three twelve she sells B cells. Yes, a, a tip of the hat to Stephanie Karst and Christiane Volbus, whose laboratories collaborated to show that not only can you propagate human noroviruses in B cell cultures, but you need uh, bacteria, enteric bacteria, and in particular, a human blood group uh, antigen that those bacteria bear to do that. And it's just terrific because it's completely opening up the field now. People can propagate the virus in culture. And uh, it'll allow many, many different things, therapeutics, studying pathogenesis. So this is a really... This is a seminal finding for sure. It's it's such a beautiful paper. It's it's a new it opens up a whole new technique and it shows you something really cool and interesting about the virus. I mean, it just really yeah, it's great stuff. It's yeah. really paradigm shifting in terms of the pathogenesis of the disease. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, the idea is that the virus is binding the bacteria in the gut and being transcytosed to the. Uh, lamina propria where the B cells are and the virus can then right. replicate in those B cells. And, so and then it, how it causes disease from there is a mystery. And that's something that needs solved. to be worked that's out. That's where right. it's going. Yeah. And then also um, in the next TWIV 313 with viruses like these, who needs enemas? Possibly the title of the year. <laughs> <laughs> well, most 99% uh, by Alan, of course, who we yes. thank for his... Uh, I'm trying to hire him. For, for his neurological project. defect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you, d Dixon, you weren't here for this. No. I wish you had been because, you know, notobiotic mice you used to work on. I did. In those animals, the gut is messed up. Correct. It's morphologically messed up. Yes, it is. And it's immunologically uh, aberrant. It's okay. naive. The, the, the immunological development of the gut is right. and if you infect those mice with a mouse neurovirus it fixes everything that's remarkable I want to see your reaction that's remarkable yes it fixes the morphological defects and it fixes the immunological defects wow so the nor <laughs> the neurovirus can replace to a certain extent the functions of the gut microbiome hmm. and this made a big splash in the New York Times because it's like, wow, good viruses. That's because it yeah. targets B cells. Is that right? <laughs> no, it's different from targeting B cells. This is a totally different. We don't know how this works. Oh. And actually, yeah, we had some follow-up oh. discussion about that because, you know, this whole notion that you need the bacteria in order to infect with norovirus. And then yes. we had subsequent episode, we did a All paper right. where you've got the mice without the bacteria and you're infecting them with norovirus. And so we had some, uh, some follow-up with some of the so authors What does the involved. norovirus actually infect in notobiotics? Well, it, in which notobiotics, cell which cell type? Does probably, it well, that's a good question. Um, so, Steph, um, Christiana Vobus, uh, I had asked her about that, and she thinks that probably M cells and M uh, are one because when she depletes M cells from mice, the the oh, virus wow. titer goes down. Got it. Okay. Anyway, right. yes, Kathy. Well, I was just going to say that um, every time I hear this part of the story, um, I think about the fact that the the germ free mice. With you know, without the bacteria, their immune system doesn't develop right because it doesn't have the appropriate antigenic stimulation. Mm. And so, instead, if you put in viruses and they give antigenic stimulation, you can now have their yeah. immune system develop correctly. Right. Uh, to me, that, that seems maybe I'm just being too parsimonious. It just seems like a simple um, duh explanation mm. for it. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Well, but I think it's. I think a lot of other things don't restore immunological function that are infectious, also. And okay. they, it, that's a good point, but I mean, I'm surprised that one virus can do it. Right. Yeah. I mean, 
So I think an interesting experiment would be to infect yeah. these mice with the other some other viruses that will replicate in the gut. So, you know, right. from an ecological standpoint, it's it's no wonder that everything is connected. I mean, you've had billions of years to evolve all these systems, and yeah. here they are. And we're just now uh, working on technologies to explore them. And yeah, it's exciting. This is, this it's, is, it's exciting. It's, it's, it's all how. connected, right? Totally. And if, if for, with a billion years, you can do a lot of connection. Yeah. So. Yes. Maybe that's the title of the <laughs> <laughs> Given a billion years of history, I could do anything. That's four what life says. You get, four, you get four billion. Remember, these viruses were around from the very beginning. <laughs> that's right. Uh, 3.8. Yeah. 3.8. Free I, okay. I wouldn't go beyond 3.8. It was pretty hot after that. Uh, so this is number nine. Number nine. <laughs> Uh, Twiff 272, entitled Give Peas a Chance. Uh, we discussed a nature biotechnology paper. First author, Bonning. Last uh, uh, author, W. Allen Miller, in which they developed uh, a, basically developed a transgenic plant that would deliver uh, a spider neurotoxin to aphids. So this is, uh, the idea is to make aphid resistant plants. And what I thought was just really amazing about this was that uh, ordinarily, if you just give this uh, spider toxin uh, to the aphids, if they just suck it up, it goes to their guts. But in order to be neurotoxic it has to get to the uh, salomic cavity and we discussed what that was a couple of weeks ago and i forget but it's (laughs) beyond the gut you got to get past the or through the gut into the into the celum oh yeah you would know about this it's a hemocele well so would alan so (laughs) at any rate um what they used to accomplish that was the uh, capsid protein from an aphid virus uh, that is called a luteovirus. It's an aphid-vectored plant virus. And in order for aphids to vector this virus, they don't, the virus doesn't actually replicate in the aphids, as I understand it, but they suck this virus up from uh, the leaves uh, as they're taking a, a, a meal. It goes into their guts, and then the capsid protein has the property that it can transcytose through transcytose the entire virus through the uh, intestinal epithelium and into the coelom. Okay, uh, and then or it hemocele. can trans uh, or hemocele, <laughs> and it can transmit from there to the salivary glands of the aphids. So right. this is a protein that is specifically designed to get the virus through these cells with, uh, without doing anything else. And what they did was they took the capsid protein from this thing, hooked it up to the spider toxin, Amazing. made a transgenic plant. So when the aphids suck on this plant, they get this fusion protein of the transcytosing capsid <laughs> protein and the spider toxin, which they then take up to their gut and it uh, then makes it to the, what is it, hemocele? Yes. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and poisons the aphids. And this is complete with GFP fusions to show where it goes, <laughs> and then the real experiments with plants uh, poisoning aphids clever, and clever, surviving clever. and et cetera. Clever, I, I just clever. thought it was very cool. And it was the first time uh, that uh, I uh, encountered this concept of transcytosis. A virus actually going through cells without doing any damage, which, of course, then we revisit again in the whole, whole neurovirus uh, <laughs> episode. Mm-hmm. Right. So I thought that was cool. Well, yeah, this is, this is a neat trick. Yeah. Plus, it's a nod to uh, plants and bugs, which we here, don't, here. Uh, yes. we don't uh, often we don't discuss enough on here. We should have a plant virologist on sometime. Well, yeah, we should. <laughs> we keep talking about that. I think that's a bingo square. <laughs> right. So for those of you playing at home. That's right. All right. Um, and my pick from this set, I was actually, um, I, I had a few. I was going to say, well, Ebola and MERS and uh, the Eugene Coonan uh, episode, which uh, you know, I thought the first two were obvious and the, the Coonan episode was just really, really cool. Um but uh, since I had a spot uh, left, even after all the other picks, 
Um, mine was uh, Vincent's interview with um, Peter Salk. Uh, so that's Twiv 281, The Salk Legacy with Peter Salk. Hmm. And uh, this is just, it's just a really, really good interaction between the two of them and it's a great interview vincent asks some asks some great questions and and peter's a, a great storyteller um and it, it's an insight um into history that you know we all know but not from this angle because this is this is jonas Salk's son and so he's he was there growing up, and his dad is you know doing this work. <laughs> and his his story about it, getting his own polio vaccine um, was <laughs> was good. Yeah, um, it was he was a guinea yes, pig for this whole thing. Yes, right? it was at the kitchen table. Is is he got the shot? Um, and you know, then of course his dad being hailed as a hero worldwide, and um, kids in schools were yeah reacting yeah. to that and. Yeah. yeah. So just that perspective on this history that, as I say, we all we all think we know, but he he lived it, um, and he had good insights on things like uh, the eradication effort uh, and the Cutter incident, and um, uh, just a really really good um, history of virology, history of medicine, human history story um, that I, I thought was very well presented. And there's video to go with it if you want to watch. I have to thank Caitlin Hawk, who connected me originally with uh, with Salk to do that. <clears throat> this year, by the way, was was Jonas Salk's hundredth birthday anniversary year. So there were a lot of celebrations uh, all over the place here in New York. There was one at NYU School of Medicine where he got his MD. There was one at City College where he went to college, and then I went to one at the Salk Institute, which of course he founded. And there, one of the speakers was. Yes. A brief pause. <laughs> was, that was wasn't introduced the speaker. Dramatically. The, the speaker was not brief pause. <laughs> the guy at Penn who writes about vaccines. What the hell his name is? Oh, Paul Offit? Paul Offit. Yeah. The speaker was Paul Offit, who talked about the Cutter incident. And it was totally riveting because he, he knows this story. He wrote a book on it, of course. Yeah. So if you ever have the opportunity to hear him speak, do it. He, he gave such a great recounting of that whole incident. Oh, Paul, Paul is a great speaker and a great writer. Yeah. Uh, and a heck of a virologist, too. Developed the rotavirus vaccine. Yes, exactly. All right, those are our 10 stories. Of course, there are lots more, right, Kathy? Right. Well, I, as I started to go through these the other day to pick out some for our class to uh, do as their extra projects, I was struck by the fact that we had a lot of shows where there were images of artistic virus models. Uh, people knit viruses, made them in counted cross-stitch, uh, really gorgeous blown glass, other mixed media, uh, floral <laughs> things that looked like viruses. Uh, one of uh, Today's listener pick is a, is a phage image kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I just think it's nice to see that uh, crossover between art and, the, and science. And so I, I made note of that. We also had a number of policy issues that we talked about besides the potentially pandemic pathogens. One was the PNAS article by Alberts, Kirshner, Tillman, and Varmus in TWIV 282. Uh, the paper was entitled Rescuing U.S. Biomedical Research from Its Systemic Flaws. And we just heard Aisha's follow-up in TWIV 316 about including postdocs in the conversation. Uh, she had that in her listener email, and I went to the uh, link where they have a whole uh, web page about it, and I think it's really important that the postdocs be included in that kind of discussion. There was uh, also a pic that I made of Keith Yamamoto talking about uh, postdocs in TWIV 274. Uh, we had a couple other policy issues on TWIV 284. We talked again about should the smallpox virus stocks be destroyed. Uh, we talked again about mishaps. I don't think we called out this TWIV number earlier today, uh, TWIV 294. We mentioned the recent uh, Ebola error at the CDC. We talked about uh, women in science in several different things. Uh, we started off with my 
uh, mini scientist Lego uh, in last year's <laughs> year end review, right. and then a uh, uh, paper by Arturo Casadaval and Joe Handelsman about how if you have women conveners for sessions at meetings, then they invite more women speakers, and uh, how that can play out and help the careers of women in science. A couple of listener emails from Sandra. Uh, and uh, also, I picked the group of Lego women scientists in TWIV 288, which included not only my chemist, but a paleontologist and an astronomer. And this uh, series of Legos completely sold out, and they're not making any more of them. Hmm. And what does this tell you? Uh, but I did hear a rumor that Lego has figured this out, and they're going to be making some more sets with other women scientists. Sure. So if, we can hope that that's the sure, case. Sure, if money's involved, they'll do it. Presume the one of Madame Curie will glow in the dark. <laughs> right. uh, so, Kathy, do you have all three of these uh, uh, women no, scientists? No, no, because no. I already had the chemist, and uh, I didn't go for the set, and now the set's no longer available. Because so. if it turns well, out that eBay. these are I'm limited sure edition, if, if it turns out these are limited edition, this could be. Uh, Big money here. Sure. Like, yeah. <laughs> like uh, yeah. you know, matchbook yeah. toys. All right. So, and then uh, we also talked about open access and science publishing. Um, I know Alan had a pick uh, in uh, two seventy four about communication and science, but I'll leave it to Alan if you want to recap anything. But it's a discussion that's ongoing, and it probably shouldn't ever go away. About you know the the open access and how to fund science publishing. Yeah. Yeah, I, my pick in 274 was um, some actual actual research on science communication. I mean, everybody involved in communicating science to the public says, well, we're, you know, we're helping promote an educated populace, and nobody actually gathers the data in most cases to check that. Are we actually <laughs> teaching people anything useful, or are we just, uh, you know, are we just a form of... Um, uh, uh, cocktail party conversation entertainment um, but uh, but the open access issue is uh, is obviously ongoing and has been for several years um, and yeah it raises things like um, how do you pay for science journalism if nobody pays for the uh, science uh, publications um, if everything's free then nobody's going to get paid and if nobody's getting paid well you know that takes a lot of the motivation out of doing the the work that goes into producing the kinds of stories that people are getting for free now um so this is something that i think the open access movement has not addressed at all um i'm not saying that it's necessarily their responsibility but everybody i talk to at plus and in in the open access community in general says, oh yeah, science journalism is, is a very important aspect of it, and, and we hope to, uh, to run news articles, um, but they never call. <laughs> you know, so I, I'm, not, I'm not getting any checks from these people. They're, they're not hiring science journalists um, yet, right. and they, don't, they, they always give lip service to the idea, but then they don't follow up. So if you say, well, Nature, Science, and Cell are doing this horrible thing by, by making money, um, but then you realize that Nature and Science especially are sources of some of the big science news stories that you read about, um, well, you know, <laughs> these things are connected. Um, so yeah, that's, that's an issue that is not yet resolved. All right, let's do a couple of emails. First one's from Abraham. In the very first two episodes of TWIV, it was discussed how the mosquitoes that carry West Nile really prefer birds so that they only go after humans in extended periods of hot and dry weather. I'm curious how these results affect that assessment for future disease propagation. And he sends a link to an article in Ars Technica, which is about a nature uh, article, uh, which is basically about the fact that you know most mosquitoes are out there don't bite people. Very few do. True. So how did this preference for people to evolve? And in this paper, what they found was that a, uh, a forest mosquito, <clears throat> sorry, uh, Aedes aegypti have, has found, they found that uh, Aedes that bite people have evolved to be able to uh, detect us with a new receptor. So Dixon, yes. what does that have to do with West Nile preferring 
forest animals. Well, actually, those are different types of mosquitoes. You can't yep. mix them together. So Aedes aegypti is one a species of mosquito, which is known as the yellow fever mosquito, by the way, and which has a rich history of study. It's also a tree hole breeding mosquito, and it's, it's primarily a feeder on uh, animals. Like that it will feed on monkeys, uh, and uh, obviously people are closely related to monkeys. So I guess the evolution of Aedes aegypti although I'm speaking out of turn here, I wish Bob Grodz was here to back me up on some of this, um, <clears throat> who was a medical entomologist, by the way, at the NIH, or just recently retired. Uh, so that's where, that was my main source of information for all of this literature. Um, it's, it's, no one really understands uh, the evolution of, of biting behaviors in mosquitoes, but we do know that they can be sorted out according to their hosts. So Culex... That's not an Aedes, that's a Culex, but they're both Culexine mosquitoes as opposed to Anopheline mosquitoes. So, and so, Culex is the West Nile guy, right? That's correct. So Culex pipiens, which is the archetype for <coughs> mosquitoes that breed in uh, polluted water and prefer birds to uh, almost all other moving critters, although they will... They will occasionally take a bite from something else if, if birds are not around, and that's, that's the crux of the issue here. Um, they prefer birds, but, and they seek them out by their CO2 emissions at night when they roost in trees. And I think we've gone through this already with crows, for instance, that ro rook in trees at night. And the, there's an enormous stream of CO2 that emanates from the trees because it's heavier than air. It, it flows down the, the, the branches, down to the trunk, onto the ground and rapidly stimulates the flight of these mosquitoes that are lying in wait for this signal so they can begin seeking out their preferred hosts. And, and so if, when birds are no longer available for that function, the impulse to reproduce overrides the ability to select a host or nothing. It's like going to a restaurant and your favorite item is not on the menu and you just turn around and go home. You don't do that. So you won't have the steak tonight. Maybe you'll have the pork chop, or maybe you'll have the brisket, or maybe something else when the steak is not available. And, and basically, it's the same way with this mosquito species. Culex pipiens is the dominant transmitter of West Nile virus, or, or its variety of mosquito. Okay, so there's like Culex species out there that they're mostly related to each other, and they, they emanate from Central Africa. That's the origin of Culex pipiens. Uh, strangely enough, that's where the West Nile virus is, or originated as well. So... So you've got these, uh, the parasite and the host co-evolving together, and uh, birds are the most convenient, I guess, source of food for this mosquito species, and maybe that's how it evolved to begin with. The most convenient host species uh, was the one that it chose by selection. It's a very cool paper where they took yeah, yeah. Uh, forest and domestic forms of Aedes aegypti. They made colonies in their lab, so the forest form doesn't like to bite people. <laughs> And the, and the other does, and they establish that the difference is an odorant receptor. Peri, peri yeah. domestic. Okay, so so this is from the lab of Leslie Vosshals uh, uh -huh. Dixon. We tried to get her on. Yeah, we Twitter, did. We did. We and tried. she said no. She said no. <laughs> she said, no. <laughs> Maybe she'll say na yes now. <laughs> no. She said no. I don't have time to, so, to talk about my work for sure. a half hour. <laughs> Before there was peri domestic people, there were forest. <clears throat> Hosts, and so that the origin of this mosquito obviously started in the forest, and then rapidly evolved into subspecies, which you could probably typify yeah. by their host preferences. Right, but the um, but that's Edes. Yeah. Whereas yeah, Culex is, is still exactly right. still a wild right. mosquito that prefers story. to bite. Exactly so, right. Hey, but, but the answer to Abraham's question is is that it's a different species of mosquito yeah, right. in the news. But, but in a pinch, Culex will choose people. Sure, beggars can't be choosy. In a pinch. Exactly. In, in a, a pinch. pinch. In a pinch. Sorry about that. Alan, can you take Carrie's letter, please? Sure. Carrie writes, I had written a while back about my tw my TWIV bump in landing a job as the research coordinator at Gonzaga University in Spokane, Washington. We have an undergraduate research program here that has been growing over the years. One of our requirements for our research students is to attend research ethics workshops. I decided that the topic of discussion for this workshop would be gain-of-function experiments. I had asked the students to read some of the articles that have been written and come to class prepared to discuss them. I also asked them to take a look at the arguments from the Cambridge Working Group and Scientists for Science Group. I had them write down what, uh, what group they would support and had them discuss the pros and cons for each side. For the final task, I asked them if the discussions had changed their opinions. I thought you'd be interested in the result. 
Cambridge Working Group pre-discussion, 18 student supporters. Scientists for Science pre-discussion, 34 student supporters. Uh, Cambridge Working Group post-discussion, 15 student supporters. Uh, Scientists for Science post-discussion, 32 student report- supporters. A total of two students changed from um, Scientists for Science to Cambridge Working Group. A total of five students changed from Cambridge Working Group to Scientists for Science. Five students were left undecided after the discussions. I heard some good discussions, and I hope this prompted our new and upcoming scientists to put some thought into proposed topics of research and implications, whether they be real or perceived, that they may have to defend. I credit your podcasts for inspiring this topic for me. Thanks for all you do to keep the young and old minds stimulated. Um, and uh, by the way, Carrie, you probably knew this, but Gonzaga University also has an illustrious history and uh, competitive debate. So um, very appropriate that you set it up this way for your ethics class. I thought you were going to say basketball. <laughs> no, <laughs> not, not that I'm aware of. <laughs> exactly. exactly. That's where I've heard of him. <laughs> Isn't that where Richard Nixon went to school also? March Madness. Oh, my goodness. Hey, Alan, you, you like debate, right? Yes. So my daughter is in, um, what is it, JSA or something? They do debates. I forgot what it's called. Anyway, they have national competitions, mm-hmm. and she went and she won this year. Congratulations. Wow. Let's do it in Washington. I don't, I don't know what, what level. She came home with a gavel. She was That's very excited. Fantastic. Excellent. She's a good debater. That's why so, I can't get her to do anything I want her to do. <laughs> so the, let me ask you all this, because I I just read this for the first time. Do you think this is a good experiment? It's just her class, Dixon. No, I know that, but do you think that's a good experiment? No, it's not an experiment. Yes, too, it is. The N is too small. No, no, they were trying to see whether or not you could sway someone's opinion by reading the arguments first. Well, the, 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 the problem is, Dixon, both sides. that the, the arguments are just position statements on each web page. They really don't have a lot of substance. Okay, so I'm not sure that that alone would be a good topic for the class, but they apparently read some other things and, and based their opinions on that. What, so, what this suggests, to me at least, is that whatever group you start off with, if the arguments are cogent and well phrased and well worded, you stick with that opinion. Well, there wasn't much of a change, Dixon. None. So but the point is, if most of the audience was neutral and you had two or three people presenting each side, you'd have a much better uh, chance at swaying people to one thing or the other after the arguments were all made. Yeah, but that's that's fairly well documented um, that people will. People actually tend to draw conclusions about issues very quickly, and then they stick to those conclusions, yeah, exactly. um, often in spite of data. Can you read an email, Dixon? I, I uh, Richard Nixon went to Whittier College. Oh, yeah, Whittier. I was just about to say the same thing. <laughs> I, okay. I don't want in Whittier, California. Right. Otherwise, we would definitely get more letters. This phrase is a question rather than, I said, didn't, I didn't say he did that. Okay, no. so fine, thank you. So he Ruth didn't. Ruth writes... Hello, my favorite virologists. Could you tell me if it's time to start worrying about MERS yet? I've been following news about it for a year, but I don't remember any cases where there were no contact with camels until now. And then she cites a a, a website uh, for that information. Thanks for responding when you have a chance. Have a happy new year. Ruth. Ruth. So, as I said before, there yeah. have always been yeah. cases where there's not been contact with a camel or any other non-human animal. No, no known contact. No known contact. Right. Eleven right. cases, that's right, <clears throat> according to this. Well, in this website. article, but there have yeah, been yeah. previous. So, this is nothing new, um, so I wouldn't start worrying. I, as I said, I think it's still localized geographically, sure. and it's also uh, mostly in people with um, difficulties in their immune systems. So, don't worry, Ruth. Right. Yeah, the the point to start worrying would be when there's sustained human to human transmission in the absence of camels. <laughs> exactly That's right. right. That's right. Exactly. By then we should have a vaccine, right? <laughs> 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 Kathy, can you take the next one? Sure. Johnny writes, "Dear lifelong teachers for lifelong learners, <laughs> Happy New Year and thank you for your gifts of continued generosity of time, knowledge, parsing, vetting, and passion for virology and rigorous science. You teach and inspire by example, and I am most grateful." And Professor V, am I correct that you mm-hmm. also celebrate January 1st as a BDED, Birthday Eve Day? <laughs> <laughs> Even if I've gotten that wrong, special wishes to Kathy Allen, Rich, Dixon, and you for health, happiness, and more unrestricted funding than you need for as long <laughs> yeah. as you want. <laughs> Continued mm-hmm. energy for 2015 and beyond. Johnny. So That's nice. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you very nice to have that. So it is, uh, January is my BDED, right? Mm-hmm. It's the Eve Day. Okay. Uh, and uh, oops, I got to turn this off. And she okay. links to a YouTube video that is an anatomically correct version of Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. 
Yes. Uh, that's really quite entertaining. <laughs> it's good. All right, Rich, you're next. Daniel writes, Dear Twiv, I am trying to investigate the quarantine science for Ebola. I have your block, Nobel laureates, and Ebola virus quarantine, but I have not found anything else yet. I think the quarantine for asymptomatic individuals is not supported by scientific research, but I still want to know the science for support of the asymptomatic quarantines, if it exists. If you have any ideas or sources, please direct me. It doesn't. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't exist. That's why you can't find it. So the... the this. The evidence suggests that it's transmitted only by symptomatic individuals. Right. right, which is what, in that article I wrote, I went through all the previous outbreaks and summarized the papers that had been written, and they all show that the for known transmissions, it's always from a, a sick person. And that's really the basis for the fact that you don't need to quarantine people who aren't sick. It could change, but so far it hasn't, so there's no need to. Well, should we do one more round so we can get through some? I know it's sure. coming up on an hour and a half here. Um, and, oh, I'm next. Jeffrey writes, Doctors, I may have misunderstood the situation, but I believe that I noticed a small error in one of Dr. Carr's statements about norovirus infectivity in episode 313. She stated that during a phase of the study, the bacteria were heat-killed and that those heat-killed bacteria no longer facilitated infectivity by noroviruses. She concluded that this implied that live bacteria were needed to facilitate infectivity. This may not be the case. It may simply be that the chemicals involved in facilitating transcytosis are heat labile. And he suggests this based on a paper that uh, he, he links on the safety of Bacillus subtilis and Bacillus indicus as food probiotics. They're looking at potential indicators of Bacillus hazards that may invalidate their use as, as probiotics. And... Um, since one of the features that's generally considered useful in probiotics is the ability to proliferate, there was a focus on adhesion to the GI tract's mucus layer and biofilm formation, a situation that I believe was similar to the bacteria in the neuro paper. And he puts a small point, a small quote from the paper here in that it's, there's a component of the bacteria that's involved in, in the activity that they were studying. While a small point in Dr. Karst could certainly be correct, I thought it might be helpful to point out that proactively preventing or at least discouraging norovirus infectivity might be possible by looking at heat label products produced by the enabling bacteria. So um, I think that was just a statement made in the paper which followed the results. If you heat and activate the enteric bacteria, the, the virus could not infect cells. But in the end, they found that a human blood group substance itself, a carbohydrate, was sufficient to facilitate infection. Right. So I think they they recognize that it's not just the bacteria, but a component on their surfaces. Is that uh, yeah, correct? The, the deal was the, the heat inactivation. We're talking about two different things here. <clears throat> One is getting along, uh, getting across the epithelial right. layer in the right. two-chamber experiment, and the other is binding to the B cells. Right. And one kind of assumes that, without any evidence, that we're, those are somehow connected, but that doesn't have to be the case. So, so if you heat kill the bacteria... Uh, you can't get across the epithelial layer. But right. those heat-killed bacteria or the purified uh, histoblood group antigen will still facilitate binding to the B cells. Right. They could be completely different things. So in this, where she's, the, the point he's citing here, uh, bacteria were heat-killed no longer facilitated infectivity of B cells in culture. So is that the experiment? That's across the... That's across the uh, uh, that's the two-chamber experiment. Yeah, okay, got it, right. Okay, that's specifically the two-chamber experiment. Good. Okay. And, you know, Stephanie just kind of uh, threw out there, her conclusion from that was that you needed, the bacteria needed to be alive to be transcytosed across the epithelial layer in the two-chamber experiment. But that's not necessarily yeah, true, right. okay? The, his point is that it could be that there's some... Uh, component of the bacteria that they themselves don't have to be living, but there may be some heat labile thing. So I copied this whole thing and I sent it to Stephanie, but just a short time ago, so I don't have any reply from her yet. But, right. the, but the, great, the, idea. Hoard, great idea. Yeah, yeah the, and the, really the point of the heat treatment of the bacteria was to do kind of an initial check to figure out what you're looking for, and then eventually they get to the specific component that you need. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. All right, the next one's from Brian, who's thanking us for uh, Twip, Twim, and Twiv, and saying that um, the podcast inspired him to go back to school for a graduate degree in parasitism. How about that? Cool. Alan, can you take James's? 
is a graduate degree in parasitism is that is that a business degree or is that political science? Law. <laughs> law. It's <laughs> law. Okay. Okay. Good. Let me clear that up. Uh, sorry. Uh, James writes. <laughs> Dear Twiv, in the beginning of episode 309, Ebola email, there was a discussion regarding quarantines and public officials. Something along these lines was stated. Of the people who have overridden the CDC guidelines, uh, which one has a PhD in virology or public health or epidemiology? There seemed to be general agreement among the TWIV crew that the public officials in question were not qualified to make decisions regarding public health, and this was somehow attributable with it to their lack of a PhD. While I agree with you that in this instance, the public officials in question should not have overridden the CDC guidelines and that politics may have played too large a role in their decision making. However, their lack of a PhD is not really the issue at hand. It's their actual decision that should be scrutinized, not the letters behind their name. Okay, valid point. Uh, there are many people without a PhD who are perfectly capable of evaluating evidence and coming to a reasoned decision outside their field of expertise. On the flip side, there are many PhDs who are set in their ways or unwilling to change their minds as new evidence becomes available or may put politics, that is, personal and professional relationships with, relationships with collaborators or competitors, ahead of just presenting the scientific facts. And we've talked about a few of them as well. Yes. Uh, I suspect that you agree with me on these points, and I'm not suggesting that you do not value the opinions and intellects of those without a PhD. I just wanted to point out that the language used could disenfranchise listeners without advanced degrees. The general public already feels a sense of the elitism coming from academics. TWIV is doing such a great service in making science accessible to more people that it would be a shame if your non-scientist listeners get turned off because of comments like these. Thank you, Angus, um, which was listed as James. Um, no, I'm sorry about I that. I don't know why. Yeah, I'm okay. Sorry, sorry. Uh, Angus is a postdoc, uh, so therefore has a PhD, but um, <laughs> yes, exa exactly. A, a very, very good point um, that, was, that was probably poorly phrased. I think we're just trying to say that they, we were they weren't trained in yeah, virology, these, right? If you're, if you're going to override guidelines by people who are trained in a field, you need to have at least as as sound an understanding of that field as they have. And, and, yeah, and my sense is that the comment, uh, not to excuse this, because I think uh, Angus is making a very important point that we've talked about before, and that is that it's really important that we uh, uh, be accessible. Yes. Um, but uh, I think the comments were directed towards uh, politicians in particular who were, uh, from what I could tell, uh, a major force behind making what was fundamentally a political rather than a scientific decision. Yes. Dixon, can you take the next one, please? I certainly can. <clears throat> Dale writes, Dear Dr. Reckoniello, this video on the Library of Congress YouTube channel may be of interest to TWIV's audience. Thanks for being a good interviewer. Maybe you should take over for Craig Ferguson. I don't know who Craig Ferguson is. Well, I was wondering about that. If you get to the to YouTube channel, maybe you can. No, he, no <laughs> somebody else in the YouTube channel. Uh, that's it's too bad. Not. Maybe you should type his name out then. Uh, this comes from Dale in Cleveland, Ohio, where it's eight degrees Fahrenheit and windy. Oh, Craig Ferguson uh, is a TV host of the Late Late Show on CBS, uh, okay. Okay. which I would not know without Google. Right, sorry. And, so, and apparently he just quit. So. Uh, maybe we should get him over. <laughs> <Yes>. right. <laughs> exactly. So we can't pay him, sorry. <laughs> and as Alan said earlier, that's a problem. Yes. Um, this is an interview with Larry Madoff. Not an interview, it's a, it's a talk who uh, is talking about the program for monitoring in emerging diseases. It's good. He's a hmm. professor at UMass. Mm -hmm. Larry is no relation to Bernie. No, uh, that's no, 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 no. Of course not. not. <laughs> hopefully not. Um, Kathy, you're next. Uh, Joy is where we are? Yeah, yeah. Joy, Joy yeah. writes, Hi, I enjoy your podcast, although most of it is over my head. When I saw this article on Doubtful News, I thought <laughs> of you and wondered about your opinion. It seems awfully simplistic for such a dangerous virus. Why or why not could this be helpful? Doubtful News is a fun site that turns a skeptical eye on current news stories. It might make a good pick of the week sometime. I love the show, and I'm learning at least a little. And the story, I never clicked through to, but it's called Man Claims to Have Invented Hand Lotion Against Ebola. <laughs> I had a look at this. This is a guy who's in the business of making lotions to start with uh, and uh, uh, claims to have a lotion that provides a, a barrier against, for example, poison ivy and that kind of stuff. 
uh, and has uh, combined that with a germicide. So the idea is to create a lotion that uh, will provide not only a physical barrier but also a germicide and would have a uh, longer lasting effect. It would is stay with you longer because it is a lotion and coats the hands longer than something like a, a hand sanitizer or something like that. And he touts it with the idea of, say, you wear it under the under gloves if you're uh, in a uh, Ebola contact situation to provide an extra uh, layer of protection. Uh, you know, I... Uh, uh, <laughs> Has skeptical. Well, you know what? I bet. I bet the overwhelming majority of people who buy and use this product will not catch Ebola. We yeah, have yeah. Alan. Exactly. <laughs> I've got a box of elephant repellent home. Exactly. Works yes, well. it works well, just the same. It'd be great for your hands, but what about acquiring it through your nose or mouth or eyes? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's not going to help. So this has not been tested against the virus. Okay. No. Right. He just thinks it will work. Right. And he said it is yeah. being tested against HIV and Hep C, whatever that means. And I never know <laughs> what it means when you test it. I mean, do you take a, a vial of virus and squirt the lotion in and see if it kills it? I don't know. I don't I know love what the, I, love, I love the comments here. <laughs> One of them is a doctor who said, I would love to have this, but I doubt it's ever going to be tested. And then someone else says... Well, if a first grade teacher can market a homeopathic jet lag yes. remedy and use her credentials as an elementary teacher as a selling point, I don't see it as any stretch for him. <laughs> yes. Wonderful. Yeah, so it's not been tested in a hand thing, a hand sanitizer, not going to be of much use. You need the more you need more uh, heavy duty stuff for Ebola. Well, uh, like the- gloves. Gloves, protective gear, etc., which we've talked about. All right, last email for today is Ricardo Rich. Hello, dear friends. As a regular listener, I've been educated about so many vector-borne viral and other diseases as controlling mosquitoes seems to be one of the solutions. Please let me point you to a company producing their second skin clothes, which, as they say, are anti-mosquito. Very clever idea, I think. (laughs) Uh, And this is uh, a... Uh, a link to an article about a company that has built, that has developed a uh, nanoparticle suspension where the nanoparticles are treated with some sort of uh, insect repellent that we don't know what it is, is proprietary, at least at the time of this article, uh, that you can treat fabric with, and the nanoparticles basically embed the uh, fabric and provide a mosquito repellent nature to the fabric, if I understand this correctly. You do understand so, it correctly. You know so that was pretty clever. In? Because I'm very familiar with it, because Orvis produces a version of shirts made for people who go fishing in places that have lots of biting insects like mosquitoes and uh, midges and black mm-hmm. flies. And the uh, product is called Buzz Off. <laughs> 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 Wonderful. <laughs> and it works. It's like insecticide impregnated bed netting. It's, it's the same deal. Um, do, do they bite through your shirt? Oh, God, yes. Yeah? Oh, my God. But your God. hands are still going to be exposed. Oh, well, you know what? You, you can sort of put up with that. But, I mean, they have big head nets for people that want to fish in oh, extreme ex- So, Orvis has a complete line of clothing based on this concept already. So, it's not new. So, these, these uh, in the article in Jizmag, uh, they say that these particles uh, are impregnated with uh, amorphous silica, silicon mm-hmm. dioxide. Mm-hmm. And that is repellent to the mosquitoes. Said it repels 81% of mosquitoes. 81% isn't as opposed, good enough. <laughs> as opposed to DEET, which repels only 40%. Wow. Well, so I don't know. Mm-hmm. I leave this to you, Dixon. No, thanks. I just stay inside. No, that's, that's, <laughs> that's right. Okay. And that'll do that. Why does he say, P.S., please dis- excuse the small size message? Because uh, it's short? Uh, yeah, I guess. We don't mind short emails. That's fine. No, Ricardo's that's our fine. Fr- In fact, those are the ones I enjoy reading the most. Ricardo's our friend in um, Portugal. We try and time it, Dixon, so you get the short ones. I understand. I okay. got it by now. I, I finally caught on. All right. Let's do some picks of the week. Dixon, do you have a pick for I us? I do. I sent it to everybody. It's in this week's <laughs> New Yorker magazine, and it's a it's a cartoon. Mm-hmm. I love the cartoons in the New Yorker magazine. Anyway, and it's a cage with two mice, 
and one of them has electrodes implanted in their head, and the other mouse is listening to the mouse that has the electrodes implanted in its head, and the mouse with the electrodes implanted in its head says... I'm not religious, just anti-science. Bingo. I don't get it at all, Dixon. And that's okay. You don't have to get okay. it. Okay. Does anyone get it? Yeah. Because it's well, having an experiment done on it. Yeah. Yeah. But He's yeah. anti-science because they're sticking probes <laughs> in his head. <laughs> right. Yes. Exactly. I see. All right. I'm thick. Thank you, Dixon. No, that's okay. Alan, what do you have? I have... Um, some photos that were posted uh, on the CERN website a few months ago, and I don't know if they've found information on any of these since then, but I've had it in my Twiv Picks queue. Um, Are you a regular visitor to the CERN website? <laughs> uh, no, no. This this just kind of uh, somehow I stumbled on there. Um, I, though I would like to say that I keep up with what they're doing. He's I, just I concerned. Um, so uh, CERN, as you know, runs um, some big physics experiments and has been doing so for quite some time. They have a huge archive of photos, and they're looking through them, and they have some photos that they don't know what they show. <laughs> really? <laughs> These are um, so funny. The cathodes are funny. Yes, be, uh, a pair of anodes, cathodes, June 1973. Some simple shapes, but what are they for? March 1970. <laughs> Who is this man, and what is he paying such close attention to? March 1970. <laughs> so, <laughs> An extreme close-up of something. Something. <laughs> 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 all left over from the NAS. <laughs> yes, so they, they have these, um, that one of them is just no idea, How August funny. 1969. How funny. Um, they're creating a wall with a honeycomb. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> it's great. So they, they have some <laughs> at least photos. The one with no idea at least has a scale bar because there's some other ones. Yes. They don't even know what size they, they are. They don't know what size the object is. It could be microscopic. It could be, you know, taking up a room. Um, so they're, they're cool. just asking if anybody knows. I see. About they're looking for help. Images. Not yes. sure they're going to get much response. But oh, yeah. Well, maybe no, we should name them anyway. You know, come up no, with they want they want truth, series. Dixon. They want truth. Yeah, truth. Oh. Kathy, what do you have? Well, I picked uh, <laughs> Wired's top microbe stories of 2014. Uh, a friend of mine, Matt, sent them to me, and I think it's a little bit like a Russian doll to have a list <laughs> inside of this episode. But I've done that before, and uh, for those that don't follow Twim and just want to have a quick fix on some interesting bacteriology stories. They're mostly, well, they're not all, but many of them are sort of microbiome related and so forth, and they're kind of fun stories. And the initial uh, image is a really pretty one of uh, C. difficile. So that's my pick. Uh, one of the stories is about, uh, we talked years ago, about fecal transplants, yep, yep. The yes. idea of curing uh, a C. difficile uh, infection by uh, repopulating one's gut with uh, sure. the microbiome from a healthy individual, and uh, that that morphed into a conversation about uh, how do you culture such bacteria if you wanted to do it in a way that was a little less gross than mm. actually using uh, original uh, stool. And uh, then we got onto a, a, a an outfit in Guelph that was making a machine called Robo Gut yeah, that they yeah, used to uh, uh, manufacture this. But so I was really interested in this, and I looked up the article that uh, uh, talks about actually taking a pill um, to do this because I was wondering if the pill was made from Robo Gut, and no, it's just differential centrifugation of uh, feces from a normal person and concentrating the bacteria in that and uh, putting it in a frozen capsule, and you take the capsule. Right. Yep. I wonder why they picked nine. I guess they didn't yeah. want to do another 10. You know, that's, everybody does 10, yeah. so we're yeah. going to pick yeah, nine. Yeah, you know, and, and it's not even a prime number. Right. <laughs> you know, not, you, you, you could do 11. That would be cool. Yep. Hmm. Or 7. Um, hmm. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, this is a, a pretty heavy one here. This is going to take an effort if somebody wants to do it. But my daughter sent me this. Uh, this is the daughter who is uh, a development officer at Harvard. That, uh, By development, what we mean is raising money. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so in order to keep the uh, development officers current on their product, they are constantly exposed to uh, various 
individuals at Harvard who are doing different things. And one of these mm -hmm. uh, is Adam E. Cohen. And this is a link to a lecture by him called uh, Bringing Bioelectricity to Light. And uh, in out of respect for my daughter, I watched this whole thing. It's an hour lecture, <laughs> and it's fascinating. Okay, mm -hmm. This is a young guy who's a Howard Hughes investigator. Mm -hmm. And in this, uh, he talks about, he's got lots of different research. This is only one bit of it. And he talks about uh, adapting fluorescent proteins uh, to be sensitive to voltage changes and using those to, wa to watch um, signal transduction through neurons. <laughs> wow. Okay? Cool. And he's got this engineered wow. to the point. This involves uh, ultra-high-speed uh, photography and then manipulation of those images to even slow them down more. I mean, this guy has done, uh, and the people in his lab have done everything. So you wind up with these images where you can actually see the wave of uh, voltage change down an axon of a neuron to a cell that it is contacting and exciting that cell and the thing propagating. Uh, and he does an absolutely wonderful job of explaining it so that anybody could understand it. And I really appreciate that. From And he starts off talking about, okay, we're talking about a jellyfish here, right? Okay, which is where the fluorescent proteins come from. And he winds up in the end putting in a plug for serendipity and basic science and et cetera. So it's a wonderfully constructed lecture. If you got an hour, it's worth it. Cool. Excellent. All right, my pick is uh, something which I can't give you a link for. I went to the supermarket the other day, and my wife, uh, she ran in and came out. She brought me this book, which you can find at the checkout counter of the AMP. It's one of these time incorporated specials. Usually it's about entertainers or some sports figure. But this one is called The Science of Epidemics. I have it right here. Inside the Fight Against Deadly Diseases from Ebola to AIDS. And um you know, I I think if you're in the supermarket you should pick it up. Because this is the first intelligent thing I've seen by the checkout counter. It's got some <laughs> articles that uh have already been published in time. Um but ch a lot of chapters on Ebola. And they have uh, virus hunters, the nine deadliest viruses. Do you guys want to know what the nine deadliest you, viruses I'm are? I'm dying. All right, I'll tell you. Go for it. Go for it. I'll tell hear. you. Then they have flu, uh, plagues through history, polio's final battle, which is good. Who's afraid of a little vaccine? It's a good pro-vaccine article. Mm -hmm. The 21st century pandemic, a virus in the kingdom. You know what that one's about, right? China's deadly secret and the end of AIDS. I, I think if, if you are, uh, if, if TWIV is a little over your head, you might read this. What and, happened to rabies? What do you mean? What happened to rabies? Is it mentioned? No, it's not. Of course not. Must be one of the, the top deadliest nine. Virus. Well, let's see what the ten deadliest. Number is it one. Ten this or is nine? Nine. Nine. That's right. <laughs> Why did they pick Bingo. nine? Why did they pick nine? nine? Because they forgot rabies. Um, this is by the number of deaths throughout history. Now, okay. Mm -hmm. And nine, we already know, is not a prime number. <laughs> <laughs> number one is smallpox, three hundred million deaths. Two All is, right. Two is influenza, fifty-seven million. Three HIV, thirty-nine million. Four is rotaviruses. <laughs> they spelled it wrong. Oops. 450,000. Five is measles, 122,000 annually. Now, this is annually always. And um. rota uh, has been annually, and everything else has been uh, total. I don't know why they changed it. Mm. Uh, number six is yellow fever, mm. 122,000 annually in the 21st century, mostly Africa. Is that an Aedes aegypti I see flying <coughs> there or some other species? How could you tell, Dixon? Mm, I need to see the wings in the back. Well, it's flying, so you can't see the angle. No, you can't. So Number seven is dengue, 22,000 annually. Eight is Lassa, 5,000 annually. And number nine is Ebola, mm. 7,000 deaths total since 1976. I don't think uh, that's I, right. No. I, th I think Ebola got bust in on that list. Yeah, I think right. so, too. <laughs> so I've got a, a teaching moment here. <laughs> Go through those really quickly again. Uh, and let me say something after each one. <laughs> Smallpox. Uh, vaccine. Gone. Uh, Influenza. Vaccine. vaccine reduced. We're still working on it. HIV. Oops. Oops. That's a tough one. <laughs> working we on it. We got drugs, though. We got drugs, though. <laughs> yes. We're working on it. Yeah. Rotaviruses. Mm. Vaccine. Gone. Vaccine. Va uh, measles. Mm. Vaccine. Yellow, gone. yellow fever. Mm, the best. Vaccine. Gone. Dengue. 
working on it. Actually, there's a paper we need to do. Okay. Because okay? yes. they got a good candidate. Last of virus. Nope. Not working on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably because it's confined geographically to uh, yeah, mostly close. Africa. Yeah. That's correct. And Ebola. Uh, and they're not, working on that we're too. Working on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On it. All right. There's some passive vaccination things in yeah. clinical trials, yeah. and yeah. Right. Right. Anyway, so a bunch of good articles, some good illustrations. 1495 can't beat it. No. I got it. Maybe it's not going to be easy to find. I have two listener picks. One is from Neva, our friend in Buda, Texas. Right. Yeah. He sends a picture of a bacteriophage T-shirt. Uh, which takes a long time to load. Here it is, Sir Bacteriophage. It's a phage with a mustache and a top hat. <laughs> Anything to teach people about viruses. I'd wear this. This is cute. This is good. Why not? And we also have a pick from Sagi, who is my colleague here at Columbia, right down the hall. You know Sagi uh, Dixon. Yes, I forgot you your name there. That's for a right. That's okay. It's What's a, his face? It's an article in NPR <laughs> online, How to Make an Unboring Documentary About Polio. So this is quite interesting. Um, a filmmaker whose name is Tom Roberts was asked to come up with a documentary about polio. He said, oh, God, polio. I thought we got rid of it. Mm-hmm. And he said, why bother making a movie? And then he went to Pakistan and learned that it's pretty intense what's yeah. going on there. And uh, so he made this documentary, which is called, what is it called? The name is good, actually. Uh, you know. Every Last Child? Every Last Child, it? yes. Yes. And so this is the story of it, and it's a pretty cool story. So uh, that you. documentary is not yet published, is that correct? Because this article is December 26th. The, uh, I read the article, I watched what appears to be a trailer. It's a trailer, yeah. Mm-hmm. This is still upcoming, and it looks like it's going to be f- amazing. Yes. Where is it going to be released, you know? Is the it? article doesn't say. Um, yeah. It's, I don't know if it'll be online free or is it going to be? It's not going to be in theaters, right? Maybe it's a Might TV. Be. Maybe it's a TV thing. Might be. Um, anyway, it, quite good. So thank you, Sagi. It's a nice pick of the week. Yeah. Among other things that uh, it, uh, from what I can see in the trailer, it really dramatizes uh, how serious the problem is in a place like Pakistan. Oh, and yeah. so it's, it's worth it's worth watching. Sure. We have actually had another email from Syria too. I bet. We don't know. Uh, where was this here? We had, here we go. Let me read Scott's email. Um, after your comments on the last twim about polio eradication, including Nigeria due to attenuated vaccine mutations, I thought you might find this story in the nation to be rather interesting. It seems that mutation of the attenuated oral vaccines is far from the only problems with eradication efforts in Nigeria. As bizarre as all this sounds, I can assure you, having lived there, that I know for a fact that it is all true. And he sends a link to an article and basically saying, you know, they interview some of the people who are trying to immunize in Nigeria, and they say, hey, they shoot us. They chase us down the street, and they don't let us do our jobs because they're wary still of this vaccine. So that's an article in The Nation. So we'll stick that in. And Scott says, regards from sunny Costa Rica. Okay, so that'll do it for TWIV 318, the first of many in 2015. There you go. We'll have many, many more. And uh, this one and all the others... All the previous 317, you can find at twiv.tv, also on uh, iTunes. And we do love to get your questions and comments. Please send them to twiv at twiv.tv. Dixon de Palmier can be found at verticalfarm.com. Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome, Vincent. I'll Dick- do my best to uh, make my appearances more frequent on Twiv. Yeah, you don't have to. It's no, fine. I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dixon, I was at Epcot and... Yes. There's a there's a thing called the land where you get in a boat and you drive through a farm, an indoor farm. Right. And they have a lot of the Have tech- you been on that, Dixon? Not yet. So That's I took pictures cool. because one of them has a label vertical farm on it. How about that? And the other has nutrient film technologies, aquaculture with the fish and the plants together. How about that? It's very cool. How about you that? You should go, Dixon. Of course I should. No, I really should. The guy who used to work there who invented tower gardens. Tim Blank mm-hmm. is a friend of mine. Are you blanking on his name? No, no, I got his name right. <laughs> <laughs> Did you go to the restaurant in the land, Vincent? That that fast food place that's sitting there? Uh, they, they use, uh, actually, it's not a bad restaurant. They use uh, oh, they use produce from yes. the, the garden. I have Fabulous. not gone to that one. Fabulous. I heard that's good, though, yeah. They use produce from there, yeah. That's right. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. I also want to point out that that's... Uh, 
that Ann Arbor is the home of Zingerman's, and I took a Zingerman's bake class, and we baked cookies for Christmas. That uh, one of them was an extruded orange cookie, and we were supposed to make these fancy S shapes. And other people were starting to get creative, and that's why we have the orange shaped cookie that you might see. Yeah, you can decide what you think it looks like. <laughs> I, I can't mention it here on Twiv, <laughs> but it might be a virus. Yep. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, great time. And Alan Dove can be found at turbidplaque.com, also on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.